Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place, all by yourselves, and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch him, even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, interesting how they broke up uh, the Gospel reading this morning, leaving out uh, some major chunks in between those two sections uh, that I read the feeding of the thousands, but also Jesus walking on water and calming the storm. There must be a reason for that. Uh, not sure what it was, but just in the sense, and because also we're in uh, Mark's gospel during uh, this season of the lectionary, um, Mark's gospel is somewhat unique in the sense that things happen very quickly. There's kind of a rapid pace uh, by which he tells the story. It's the shortest of the Gospels, and the author packs in as much Jesus stuff as he can. So there is a lot of the stories that are told are shorter. And one of the things that's uh, noticeable when you read his Gospel is there's a lot of immediately. Things happen immediately. Immediately this happened, immediately this happened, immediately this happened. And it does give one a sense a number of things. There's a sense of urgency for what's taking place, uh, perhaps to instill in the people who would have read or heard that that gospel uh, a sense of urgency for a number of reasons. One, they may have thought that Jesus was coming back quickly, but also there is just a sense of urgency that is kind of presented to us, and that's the salvation of all of humanity is at stake. And we should have a sense of urgency in that because it should matter to us because it matters to God. Um, but also just thinking about this immediacy, portraying, I, I think, what was probably the case in the, the real like scene of what was taking place. Um, for those of you who have watched The Chosen uh, the way that they present that, it, I, I, you know, I'd like to think it's a fairly accurate representation. And the Gospels do mention this. Wherever Jesus went, there were crowds of people. There was always something going on. He created quite a stir. And, and we're told that his fame spread quickly for a lot of reasons. The things that he was doing were miraculous. The things that he was saying were crazy and thought-provoking and emotion-provoking. Um, it's no wonder that wherever he went, crowds gathered. And you also sense in that the hope that perhaps people had uh, when they lived in the first century and whatever problems they were dealing with, looking for solutions, looking for healing, looking for rest. And rightfully so, those stories in the Gospels are about Jesus. They are Jesus-centric because they should be. But there was others that followed him. And, and there was a great amount that was demanded or asked of them in being his disciples, in following him. 
the misunderstanding of what was taking place. Jesus wasn't always crystal clear on what was taking place. And much like our interactions with our God, doesn't always give us the blueprint for what's going to be happening over the next period of time. We are encouraged to walk by faith and let Jesus, let God be in charge. I think I talked about that last week. Um, but for them, it must have been very chaotic. And those verses that I read do portray that. They had just returned from being sent out and, and uh, being instructed by Jesus to not take anything with them other than their sandals and a cloak uh, and to go out and witness, to go out and to cast out demons and to heal and to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And they got back and they were probably very excited, but I'm sure they were very exhausted. I mean, if you've ever been on a mission trip, you've probably experienced that it's you try to pack in as much as you can in a shorter period of time as you can. And they came back. And we see in Jesus, not just the miraculous Jesus or the thoughtful Jesus, but we see the pastoral Jesus. And he recognizes in his disciples their need. They're exhausted. And with all that's taking place around them, Mark tells us they didn't even have a chance to sit down and grab a meal. That they were so hurried and, and people were coming and going with such force that, well, Jesus being the pastoral person that he was, and by the way, the shepherd references, um, our word pastor is from that same root. It's, it's a shepherd. I, I'm a shepherd. Ish. Kind of. Maybe an under shepherd. Because there is only one good shepherd uh, that Jeremiah spoke of that God was going to send. But um, recognizing in them they needed something. And that thing was rest. That thing was a chance to step out of the chaos of everything that was taking place in their world on their own first century hamster wheel. Just wheels spinning. Uh, some of you can probably relate to that kind of life. At least those of you that maybe aren't retired, the practical things of our lives, uh, things like these silly devices connect us with everything. And there is always a sense of urgency. We live in a microwave world where we want things done right now. We have very, very little patience in waiting for things. When something goes wrong, we lose our patience quickly and look for that immediate fix and solution. The chaos of our life. Even for those of you that, that don't live in that sort of world of always coming and going and needing to do things, there is still chaos in your world. I don't think any of us are absent of it. You may, even if you're retired or lead a more relaxed lifestyle, there's probably things that you think about doing that you should do that, eh, I don't feel like doing today pressing matters that, well, it can wait. Um, something drawing your attention, a phone call that can be made, a letter that can be wrote, a text can be sent, um, whatever it might be that pulls and draws on our attention. Um, and it's been said, if you know, the devil can't take away our faith, he'll make us busy because busyness is the handiwork of the devil. And we don't always think of Jesus as being that kind of pastoral shepherd as he's portrayed sometimes in scripture. And similarly, I mean, it's this is the Godhead. This is the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit completely understand us. They get us. Jesus intuitively and divinely knows when he steps out of the boat in the second half of what I read, that he sees the crowd and recognizes with compassion their, what's missing for them. They lack a shepherd. They lack the protection. They lack something or someone to look after them and to recognize what they need even when they don't themselves and to lead them to that place as the psalmist wrote to those still waters 
to a place of calm? Do we not all need sometimes to just get off the crazy train? Sometimes step out of the hamster wheel just to breathe. I do, but it's hard because of the noise, because of the chaos, because of the things that draw us and pull us into always doing more. Because I, I often feel like if I do more and I get caught up, then I'll have that moment where I can stop without feeling guilty and just sit in front of my TV and just click the channel button until I find something interesting enough that I could turn my brain off before something else clicks in and goes, oh, you should write that email or you were gonna do this or this really needs to be done. That I've conditioned myself and the world has encouraged me to condition myself to live into the chaos because it's the norm. But God says we all need a Sabbath. The Sabbath was not made for God, but it was made for humans. The people of Israel misunderstood the law as it was giving, given and its purpose, the intent of it. It wasn't just to force yourself to take rest. It's because God knows us, understands the world we live in better than we do. And not everything, God doesn't do everything for our sake. God does things for his sake that benefit us. And there's these invitations like Jesus invited the 12 to go to a place of rest. Now it didn't happen. Because sometimes, what do they say about the best of intentions? But the invitation is always there. God is working for his good through us that we benefit from. And those invitations for that place and space and time of rest. And we have the opportunity to step out and to somehow detach ourselves from that chaos. Jeff talked about this yet last week. Uh, his sermon was much better than mine and significantly shorter, which I appreciated. I could learn from that. That in the chaos or darkness of our world, there is always that place of light. There is always a light that shines, and it's like a lighthouse. It's always on. We have to move towards it. And just like that offer of rest to us from our God and from our Savior, if we don't take him up on that offer, we will not find it. I've heard that in scriptures, there's 365 instances where it's written, be still. I don't know if that's true. I haven't counted. And it's probably coincidental that it's 365 days in the year um, because we do have leap years. Where's that extra one coming from? It's 366 in that year. But it, it is a solid reminder, it's frequent, that that invitation is there. But much like if a doctor prescribes a medication or a treatment for you, and you don't take the medication, or you don't follow the treatment, your problem's not going to go away. If you buy a piece of gym equipment in your home because I'm going to work out, and you hang laundry on it, <laughs> Your laundry might get in shape, but just having it there doesn't really do anything. We don't have to do in order for God to offer it to us. But we also, again, live in a world where we want it to happen immediately. So in those practices of the things where we find rest, in our prayer, in our study, and in our silence, and in our resting, and turning off and tuning out, if we don't get an immediate return on that, the first or second time we try, well, it's not working. So I'm going back to what I was doing because that works so well. But it doesn't. The thing is, in Scripture, when we get those instructions or those invitations, commands, if you want to call them that, 
of, of seek me first or those of you who are weary and burdened, take on my yoke. That's the tenor of those verbs, the tense of those verbs is rarely in the singular, do it once and the result of it's going to be what I'm promising you. It's almost always do this on a continual basis and there you will find rest. Continue to come to me to seek that rest and there you will find it because the rest is never permanent. It's only eternal once we've left this world and we don't have to hustle and bustle anymore. But step outside these doors and guess what's out there? Everything that you left when you came into this place. Isn't it nice that we're in a sanctuary? I hope that you're not thinking about all of those things that are taking place out there, but that you have a chance for rest. One of the many reasons why being in worship is so helpful for us. But I promise you, when you walk outside these doors, you're stepping back into the chaos. And it doesn't take much. One of the best parts of my and most useful and beneficial parts of my day that I set aside almost every day for me personally, not involving my lovely wife, because those are the best parts of my life, but is the time that I spend walking for about 30 minutes a day. And I don't do it for exercise. Um, I do it so that I can pray. Because if I'm just sitting somewhere in a quiet place, my mind just starts going out. It's like you see a squirrel. And as soon as I see something or something else pops into my head, I can't stop it. And I forget where I was, but somehow I'm able to lock in. And it's not that I get what I want when I, when I pray. It's that I'm, I'm stepping out of the chaos for 20 or 30 minutes, at least five days a week. And I get that place of rest so that I can jump back into the chaos of the world on the hamster wheel and I can endure that. And if I don't do it for a while, I notice it. Because I'm not getting that rest and there's many other things that I do but that's just one thing for me and I learned that over time and what a difference it makes because man is this world crazy I mean, everything that I talked about last week and all of the insanity of our political world and the tension and everything else it's not going away and you can go down that rabbit hole and watch the news programs and the talking heads and them telling you all the things and there's a never ending news cycle of it. And they want you to get sucked into it so that you get worked up and you get fired up and you want to fix and change and get angry. And it takes a lot more energy to be angry than it does to forgive. It takes a lot more energy to live in that world than it is to step out and take rest and check out of it. Because honestly, we don't have control over it. And the reasons why those things exist is certainly not to inform us or to, it's just to make us want and crave and get addicted to it and want more. And so whatever it is of the chaos, health, concerns, busyness of a job, up in the air that you're waiting for, all of it, just being alive and a part of this world, it's, it is never ending. But this to me is that invitation that Jesus offered to his disciples to say, where will you find rest? Maybe it's listening to music. Maybe it is just sitting in front of a TV mindlessly watching something that isn't chaotic. Whatever it might be, that invitation is always there. It's a prescription for our own mental health. But like real medication, if you don't take it, it's not going to work. We have to participate in it. And we get, understand that it is a process, not an instantaneous fix. And if it's not working today, well, give it time. See where that goes. See where you find your rest. That's my encouragement for today.
good people of grace.